So our next speaker is uh, going to be uh, Brandon uh, from AWS. Uh, Brandon has significant uh, experience in the uh, global tech industry. Hey, Brandon, I nice see you. Hi. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so he has uh, been part of uh, deploying a lot of HPC systems for researchers around the world, many of which have actually made it to the uh, like top 500. He holds a degree in physics and apparently he visits the hospital a lot because he likes bicycle. <laughs> so without Broke further ado, too many times. <laughs> so hopefully you don't break any this year. Uh, and let me try to update like this. The older I get, the more sensible I get, and, and, and I get closer to discovering what causes all these broken bones. <laughs> well, we all hope that that Doctor is. Doctor, it hurts when I do this. Stop doing this. Yes. Is the, uh, is the advice. So yes, uh, uh, it turns out to be good. Let me try to see. Um, full screen. Full yes. screen should work. Yeah. Yes. I did this by the way because there's a lot of crazy fonts in here because the you know, okay. My, my company has chosen to have a. Yeah, I, I, font, which is yeah. frustrating. Yes, uh, I'm cool. Sure. How many uh, people do we have online? Uh, we have a few. Um, let me try to um, hide this so that we don't uh, keep that showing. Yeah. Right. Oh, we don't have remote attendees. Okay. So, okay, cool. All right, but I'll stay here, and that's actually going to help my voice because I've got to the end of the week, and my voice is starting to diminish it's a good thing i'm not here to sing um anyway so um uh thanks for that introduction so yeah my name is brendan bullfire i head up our uh hpc developer relations team inside uh, hpc engineering at aws and so um i i think there's probably uh there's a bit of background here there's a, there's a very small number of slides so and 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 perhaps we'll finish a little earlier and we'll get off to lunch uh sooner but um there's as, as a bit of context um uh, AWS, you know, we we looked at uh, at the the problem of actually um, uh, enhancing application scalability because it's the way that we always look at these things. We're we're not we're not fond of looking at micro benchmarks to do analyses inside the company. So we always look at the customer's workload and work backwards from that. And in particular, we're looking at application scalability for HPC codes. And of course, several years ago, we looked at that problem and we said, well, you know, we're we're causing we're forcing customers to use uh, TCP sockets for their MPI over over Ethernet. It's either gig Ethernet, and then we got excited and we went to 10 gig Ethernet, and that really wasn't moving the needle very much because of all of the things that we all know uh, about that domain. And so we needed to actually address the application scalability problem. However, and, and you know the the initial instinct we had was as a bunch of HPC engineers was well, let's just go and shove a bunch of InfiniBand in there somewhere in the data center and and you know wire up some boxes and do it the traditional way. Um, we, we didn't think, well, we were, it was kind of reticent to do that. And we, it was good that we actually did a double take and, and had to think longer on the problem. Um, not because InfiniBand is a terrible idea. It's a great idea. Uh, it's just that InfiniBand was never, never designed for the environment that we find ourselves in. And that's where I think some of the, some of the things that we've learned out of this are going to be perhaps useful in the exascale era because, uh, most of our, larger regions you could you could well and truly argue are exascale machines it's just nobody's you know gone and run linpack on a single you know as a single run on these things uh all at one go um it'd be a terrible it'd give terrible efficiency by the way if we were to do so because you know that that exascale is of you know highly heterogeneous uh, uh node types but um <clears throat> but these the, but the other reason why nobody's ever actually gone to run linpack on a very large scale uh, our structure is that most of those machines are actually in use and they're in use 24 hours a day by literally millions of customers that are that are doing things and sometimes those machines are selling soap um, or costume jewelry on amazon.com in a retail store sometimes they're serving up videos to you through netflix and then other times they're running molecular dynamics codes for a drug company that's searching for a cure for you know for a virus right so um so with that, you know, with that in place, so the, the, the constraints on us are, are very different from the normal constraints of when you're sitting down to architect a, you know, a large scale supercomputer or an HPC cluster. Um, the machine is going to be on all the time. Uh, we have to service everything in place. We can't refactor the network occasionally when we think we need to just, you know, rebalance the fat tree to go for a larger structure. It can't be done. Um, customers really take umbrage to having uh, a cloud data center shut down for a few days at a time while we rewire things or expand the network. So it has to be able to cope with sort of this monotonically increasing, ever expanding structure 
Uh, it's going to be heterogeneous. Uh, there's going to be vast numbers of different workload types. Um, and the the traffic and you know the traffic problems and collisions and, and random hotspots is a very, very high probability in terms of the way that network operates. Uh, and of course, some of our data centers are well, our data centers are, they're enormous. Uh, so if you get a couple of, you know, if you if you don't if you don't say, for example, ask for a placement group is what we call a, you know, what we call a placement group, please put, please give me a collection of nodes that are close to each other. And we've got algorithms in our control plane that, that ensure that. Uh, if you don't ask for a placement group, you might get a couple of nodes that are half a mile or a mile away from each other in a single data center. Uh, and then the curvature of the earth really does become a latency problem. Um, and you can beat us up for that genuinely, but, but I mean, there's a single switch you put on the command line when you're when you're doing your request and you get a vastly different result. So, so with all that in mind, I guess, uh, hang on, how do I? Uh, the arrow buttons aren't, uh, oh, hang on, oh, oh. Okay, so with all that in mind, you get you, you get the idea that that, that was sort of the, the pretext. And so, we, so we, we actually went for a different approach to this. Um, we didn't put in a bunch of InfiniBand. Um, and we came up with this notion that, that particularly for the use case that we were trying to get to in the first case, um, we thought we'd approach this, we're, we're looking at trying to improve CFD code performance. That was really the, that was the exemplar use case. It's the, it was the workload that we we're seeing the most from, from commercial HPC customers. It was the thing that was really going to, you know, grease the financial wheel to if we got it, if we got it right. So, um, so we looked at that uh, and we thought about what, what was the problem that the CFD codes were doing, you know, what was actual, what was the actual challenge? Well, at an MPI level, when the, you know, when the nodes are actually wanting to talk to each other, they weren't exchanging a single packet. And so it sort of got us away from the distraction of focusing on single pack, single packet latency. Um, and at least it distracted enough as enough for a while that we started to see perhaps there were some other solutions to the, the CFD problem. Typically when CFD codes want to talk to each other, they want to throw vast numbers of packets to each other. Um, it's, it's enormous numbers of messages, not a small number of messages. So the, the problem started to, you know, the solution started to emerge when we thought about that a little bit more. We, we still like the idea of OS bypass, IDMA, doing some, you know, doing all of the right things there. We also had this other thing that we had going for us at the time, which is a thing called Nitro. Um, and since we're virtualized, um, what we, you know, over, over the years, we, we wanted to remove and, and well, we wanted to reduce and then eventually remove the hypervisor tax that we all, you know, the performance tax induced by hypervisor. Happy to say that we've done that. And it was done by basically putting all of the hypervisor services out into a bit of hardware that we built that's, that's this Nitro board that sits, its daughter board sits in the back of the box, uh, the back of the node. The, uh, what we did is we, we turned all of the things that a hypervisor would normally um, uh, construct for you in software, uh, you know, virtual devices and, you know, virtual network devices, virtual disk devices. And of course, we also have virtual virtual disk devices that are served up over the over the network uh, so that we can give people elastic block storage of any varying types and characteristics and just deliver to the node. And it looks like a local disk. So, so we had this Nitro board and the Nitro board does some cool things because what it does is it turns all those software services into hardware calls. And so when you're talking to, our, to, to a, you know, when you're talking to the LUN, which has got your elastic block storage attached to it, that's the, over the network, that software service is running on the Nitro board in silicon, uh, and then it's presented to the rest of it's presented to the motherboard and to all the, and to the operating systems um, as a just as a as a PCI device. And we do the same thing with the network devices and so forth. And so we can do quite a lot of creative work with this Nitro board. It makes it incredibly secure, by the way, and that's a, it's a really that was the original uh, design goal for Nitro. But it also gives us quite an incredible palette of things to, to paint with. Anyway, so all of this led eventually to the idea of this thing called SRD that we came up with. So it's a it's a it's essentially a remix on the on the InfiniBand reliable datagram protocol. Uh, we came up with this thing called the scalable reliable datagram. Um, and and what what SRD does, what SR, you know, what we did with SRD is we relax the constraint of the packets having to arrive in order. That was the first thing that we did, and the the and because because we also knew that we were going to be dealing with tens of thousands of packets probably in in most circumstances. Our network is very large and complicated. The that's that's sort of an animated GIF that's that's gone with the PDF here, but um, 
uh, you know, our networks are complicated. That's not our network, but I mean, you know, you can imagine we use a lot of CLOS networks. We also use a lot of other kinds of network topologies in our, uh, in our data centers. But the larger the numerical size of the job, you know, the more nodes you're using, the much more complex the network infrastructure gets in between any two nodes. Uh, and the vast number of additional pathways that there are between any two nodes. So we decided that if we relax the in-order packet constraint uh, and we could deliver the packets out of order, that gave us the freedom to actually send all of the packets over multiple pathways all at once. And so we actually just deliver the packets like a swarm over the, over the fabric. Um, that means that SRD has got to keep track. It uses you know, it uses ECMP to actually keep track of all of the multiple pathways. We don't use every possible pathway. Then we, we typically choose the best 16 or so uh, and stream them at once. And we, we've got the capacity, therefore, to, to expand that over time. We could go for 32 pathways and whatnot. But um, is there a question? Yeah. Um, I was wondering uh, why not UV and why did you go for RD instead of, let's say, UV? Was there a reason to add that reliability at the if if we if we think that we need to assert it again, we can assert it higher up the stack. I mean, it just wasn't a. We, we're experimenting, by the way. I mean, this this whole thing was an experiment. So so we're exploring to see what actually impacted application performance, and that was going to be our our candle. Now, standard candle for this experiment was going to be to see what it did to actual real applications. So um, so some of these things were just lucky guesses. Some were some were not. Um, and so we, you know, some of some of these we had to come back and iterate again over time. So, um, so we, so we, we came up with this. We, we came to this approach. It, it has some great aspects to it. Uh, we don't have a head of line blocking issue. When an individual packet gets lost, it doesn't hold anybody up. Um, all of the other streams just complete, uh, and we go and find that packet. You know, re, re, reissue it and and get it back to the other end. Uh, and what this what this did is it just it dramatically dramatically dropped the uh, P99 tail latency. Uh, and so for, for things like uh, uh, machine learning codes, nickel-based nickel, uh, nickel -based codes and MPI codes, of course, most things are only as fast as the slowest rank. Uh, and so that actually had a, a pretty dramatic impact on the application performance for these codes. Uh, the other thing about it is as the, again, as the job gets numerically larger, um, the number of pathways expands. And so the number of options that we've got for for using in parallel expands as well. Uh, if you do the math, it's it's more or less flat. So as the so as the job gets larger, even in highly congested environments, when there's a lot of other people, you know, we see on traditional HPC clusters uh, the stuff that that we all here are familiar with building normally. Uh, we see that you know when you've got some noisy neighbors that are hammering the Luster file system, that can really have an impact on the MPI traffic for a type of couple jobs running on the rest of the cluster. Uh, we don't see that with EFA uh, because typically the luster is getting routed through multiple other pathways, right? Using the same technology, so um, so it, so it, you know the 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 end result was actually a very pleasing one uh, for some CFD codes, right? And we we were testing these things with things like uh, Open Foam, uh, and then eventually we you know we had to get through we had to get through a lot of software development to make to expose. Uh, to expose every to to expose to an MPI as a lib fabric provider, um, and, and I think I've got a slide in here. Got a slide further down here. Of course, MVAPitch is supported, uh, Open MPI is supported, and so is uh, Intel MPI. And so, of course, that allowed us to climb further up the stack into uh, commercial codes, on you know ISV codes in particular, things like Ansys Fluent, Star CCM, and so forth. And so, we started to actually see. Uh, great performance with CFD codes, and when I say great performance, it was, it was, it was. We were getting the same, uh, if not in a few cases, a little better uh, computational efficiency <clears throat> on the same CPU platforms with this as as we were doing on some of the InfiniBang uh, uh, based based life forms that we had to compare to. So, so that that told us we we'd, we'd found something pretty good, and we we're onto something. Um, now, of course, there's still there's still a latency problem because we still have quite a high latency structurally in our network, right? Our switches are software, there's a software defined network, so there's a whole lot of latency that gets inserted in there. We were very keen to find out, uh, you know, and, and I was, a, uh, I've got to say, I was a card carrying skeptic on this project uh, because I wasn't expecting to see this 
be a solution for a lot of the, you know, the traditionally very latency bound codes, things like weather simulation codes. That's where I was really expecting to see it fall apart. Um, so there are three or four different uh, weather, weather codes we actually tried it on. Uh, and we we're, you know, again, we we're expecting to see it fall apart. Um, it scaled as good as a Cray, uh, which was very pleasing. Um, it, you know, we had, you know, when we, when we compared it to the same CPU architecture, the same CPU generation architecture, we were scaling about as good as Cray. I mean, it was, it was more or less flat out to several, out to, I think at the time it was about 500 nodes is where we, is where we stopped. Um, that was actually quite surprising, but it, and, and we've done, you know, a lot of subsequent work to try and discover why that was so surprising. Part of it is that it was, you know, stemmed from our own ignorance that um, turns out that there's a lot of codes out there that actually um, uh, are not single packet latency bound. They're a P99 tail latency bound. Uh, and when they're running on real clusters with real normal network conditions and congestion and so forth, noisy neighbors talking to the infinite, you know, to the, to the luster file system and so forth, it turns out that in practical circumstances, uh, those, those things, uh, the latency factor is not the thing that's going to actually be the gating factor to performance. So, are, are they latency sensitive at all, or are they sure. just pretty good at latency hiding? In sure, case? definitely. I think I think they're. I think look, latency. We haven't made latency go away. Obviously, um, latency hasn't gone away. Definitely, they're good at latency hiding. Everybody should be trying to do their best to 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 um, uh, to you know perfect those techniques in their code. Um, but also I think EFA is a latency hiding technique, right? And so that's the, you know, that, well, SRD, really the, the datagram, um, that is the latency hiding technique. So, I mean, it's a, it's a, um, you're, you're hundred percent right. Latency is still there. Uh, we're still doing everything we can to try and reduce our latency. But the interesting thing is that it, it reduced the urgency of that being our primary problem. Um, I think the other lesson for it, and I think this is where we need to think about it, exascale. Um, as, as, as we go to exascale and just the sheer numerical size of the clusters goes up by perhaps an order of magnitude. Um, and of course, I mean, zeta scale is the, you know, we've had a few conversations about that recently. Um, but as we go to these incredibly increasingly large, numerically large clusters, uh, we're all going to have to get better at doing latency hiding in our fabrics um, because that, uh, uh, you know, the curvature, the, the, the boxes aren't going to become micro to, you know, faster than the scale at which we want to build large numbers of them. Our data centers haven't shrunk, um, you know, and the, uh, they're, they're growing faster than I can, than we can keep up with in most cases. So it's a, it's it's an ever present problem and it's only going to get harder. So we need to, you know, this is this is definitely a technique that worked for us, and I think it'll probably work more widely. Um, so, um, uh, you know, the first the first instance that we produced, the first product that we produced that had this buried in into it was a thing called the C5N um, Intel Skylake um, uh, box. We pushed it out with a hundred gig EFA network on it. Um, uh, got great performance. Got really great you know, uh, feedback from the community that was working. We built these things called the P4Ds, you know, the by and large, our commercial HPC customers are voracious GPU consumers uh, doing, mission, you know, doing model training, um, probably to decide, you know, whether it's a picture of a cat or a picture of a different type of cat, almost certainly. But um, uh, we, we, we that, that, that actually forced us to actually work at how to do multi-rail. Uh, so we, you know, 400 gigabits were at the time composed of, of four by 100s. Uh, we're actually doing a step change in the technology over the next year. And so going for a higher, uh, higher line rate uh, individual rails. And so that means we'll be able to expand the, the bandwidth even further. Uh, but this was a, you know, we built, a, I think at the time it was like a, I want to say it's like 10,000 GPU cluster. Um, uh, with you know with 400 gig uh, connections and so forth it also that also pushed us to come up with a thing called GPU uh, GPU direct RDMA uh, which the, the name kind of implies what it does um, so so we you know it's it, as we've gone along we've expanded uh, the software now keeping in mind everything is still only exposed everything is still exposed as a uh, as a lib fabric provider 
So to all of the MPIs that use Libfabric, which hopefully most of them, <laughs> most of the modern ones uh, do, um, uh, and hopefully more of the future ones do, um, uh, then, you know, it's a, it, it is a uh, look ma, no hands. You don't need to actually know about EFA in order to operate on it, right? You should, and from our point of view, it should just be a simple drop replacement uh, for your code. So you should be able to just drop your code onto the cloud and run it there. Um, anyway, so last year though, uh, we went bananas with it. And so what we've really done is we've stuck EFA, it is the default network interface in all of the devices that we build now. Um, so, um, it's not always a hundred gigabits, right? And that actually led to another discovery. There's a lot of codes out there that don't need a hundred or 200 or 400 gigabits. Uh, some codes do obviously. And so we have to build for that. Um, but our, you know, the other, the other factor, and this is the, really the other, um, great delight out of not just going the original solution pathway, which is to build a, uh, an InfiniBand ghetto in the corner of the of the of the um, data center is it means that EFA is you know EFA uses our Ethernet infrastructure that we've got through the entire uh, through the entire fleet. Um, it's it's characteristic of the version of the Nitro board that's on the device as to whether we can do EFA on the device, but all of our new modern devices that we're building for all of the future you know the current and future generations of uh, EC2 instances have EFA. And so some, some, of the, some of the instances have 30 gigabits of EFA, some of them have 20, 10, uh, some of them are 100, uh, and we're, and as I said before, some of them are 400 for the, for the larger GPUs, and we're iterating on that over time. But it, it gave us an interesting discovery because uh, CFD codes, as it turns out, only need about 30 or so gigabits uh, for, you know, of, of good high performance communication fabric in order to do their job on these, you know, on the current, uh, uh isolate processors. So, so, you know, it, it allowed us to find out that we, you know, that the customers running CFD codes don't have to have a hundred gig in order to be able to do that. So it, it's, a, it's again, a cost savings that we can deliver back to those customers so that don't have to buy, uh, or more to the point rent such expensive infrastructure. Uh, they can go for something cheaper and and most codes have got you know we all know this that that virtually all codes on hpc clusters have got different characteristic needs uh, it allows us to actually come up with clusters that align to the codes and if you've got a diversity of codes you could have a diversity of clusters or at least a diversity of node types uh, with different different network capabilities and different cpus and so forth so we've kind of gone berserk that that's actually just going to continue um we are just you know this is now mainstream efa is now mainstream uh and we've got dozens of instance types that uh, that serve it uh we've got some dedicated hpc instance types so this is our hpc uh, uh, hpc 6a uh, which is an amd based an amd based device with 96 cores uh it's a couple of milan processors um lots of memory 100 gig efa uh, and as we go along with this new theme of having an hpc dedicated instance type these are sort of for the uh, for the folks who just want mm, absolutely rock bottom lowest price per core uh, it gives us the ability to to keep iterating on that uh, and then i think the uh, the last thing i really want to say because i realize we're at time last thing i want to say is just this interesting thing which is that ifa is now enabling it's enabling some customers to do some interesting thing it's enabling us to do some interesting things. EFA and SRD are now becoming quite entrenched in our normal operations. So in fact, uh, there's a lot of operations you might do in the, you know, in uh, through the AWS console uh, that cause big payloads of data to move around between your instances and other things on the network. You could be, you could be reasonably certain that in many, many cases, SRD is carrying the traffic for you and you're not aware of it. Um, but this is a case where, um, uh, some TV broadcasters needed to move a, uh, an awful lot of uncompressed video around inside the cloud in order to virtualize an entire TV production facility in the cloud. Um, and, and EFA was, was essentially able to, uh, to make that, uh, make the transport and make the recovery of, of lost packets uh, so invisible that, that they're able to, to just move this stuff around without compression during a production, production play. And it's, 
I mean, it's a, it's, uh, there's, there's much more detail than I've got time to go into here and, and give it justice to, but um, it's, it, it's an interest, it's an yet another interesting use case where something we built for HPC, where we took a rather different approach has allowed us to solve some other problems. And so it kind of reinforced, re reinforces to us why we take that approach uh, to actually just sometimes go back to fundamentals and look at what the source of the problem is and see if there is an alternative way to look at the solution. So anyway, with that, uh, I'll stop talking and maybe answer any questions if there are any. Um, yes. But first, let's thank the speaker. Uh, Rob, from Intel. Uh, I'm not sure if you saw the talk that I gave, but I think what you talked about played very nicely against it. Um, I also focus a lot on the P50 versus the P99 latency. Mm. Um, I, I wanted to, to pose kind of a high-level question to you. How much of legitimate real-world uh, performance is gated on the difference between P50 versus P99 versus actually improving the P50? And it sounded like from your talk, mm. you were surprised it was the former. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, look, we're always surprised because there's, there's, I mean, the, there's just a, there is a vast diversity of codes out there that uh, uh, that all have different needs. I I, I still think, um, I mean, the P50 is still going to, it's still going to be important. And, you know, I mean, that's just going to, that is going to push us down that path of having to improve our latency and having to lower our latency. Uh, I mean, it's still over 10 microseconds. And that's, you know, for most of the people in this audience, you go, oh my God. But interestingly, for most of the codes, by and large, for most of the codes we've tested, um, the latency is in the gating factor. So, you, so you know, to your point, I think, uh, but but that doesn't that doesn't actually mean that it's not, and it doesn't mean that the difference between P50 and P99 is not a driving factor. Um, I think there's just plenty of performance left on the table for us to all scoop up. Um, and it's going to push us a little harder, uh, probably soon. We've just started to automate more of the performance testing and, and regression testing that we do. Uh, we've got some regression tests that we run uh, in every region every day, three to three to four times a day per region, uh, where we run a sort of a battery of um, HPC codes, things like Wharf and Gromax and um, uh, Wharf and Gromax and my, you know, I think it's, it's Wharf, Gromax and OpenFoam are the three that we, that we do the most. We run those multiple times a day in, in every region with random clusters that we spin up. And we're basically, we're just looking for have we screwed up something with a firmware refresh that was pushed out to the fleet, and we just want to see that before customers do. Um, but but we're now starting to automate more performance testing so that we can get across a great vast set of codes. And in fact, you might have seen our announcement earlier this week with the SPAC community uh, around a binary cache. And so that's sort of like step number one. Uh, we're now able to, we've got maybe a thousand codes in the spec binary cache that we can pull from and just pull in and run very quickly, uh, and check performance. And so we're just, we're, and that having all of those codes already pre-built, uh, and then being able to put workload cases against them means that we can start to automate the mapping of the terrain to find out where the holes are, because we will find them. We, we know, we know, for example, that uh, NAMD performance isn't great, right? So Charm++ always needs a little more work on, a, on an interconnect before it's, uh, before it's happy, before NAMD is happy. Um, that's something that we're doing at the moment. So, but there's, there's, there are gaps out there for sure. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, if so, I have just one more that before uh, that we let you go for lunch. Sure. Uh, so, uh, regarding the multi rail, are you only focusing on multi rail for GPU instances or are you also focusing for these dense uh, multi core CPU clusters as well? If I could tell you, I'd have to kill you. Um, there are, we've got, we've got some new instances, you know, lined up in the, in the roadmap for later this year. Um, um we're we've got a we've got a few step changes i can't say when we've got something coming that's multi-rail but there there are more multi-rail things it's not going to be just gpus it's just that gpus is the thing that currently exercises is the most okay. when we're able to buy them <laughs> um i hope you bought enough of them because actually next month the price is going up 20 percent so. right <laughs> I think our procurement people are kind of famous for avoiding potholes like that. <laughs> Good for you. But, anyway. uh, thank you very much.
Thank you. That's a wonderful talk. Let's start. Thanks. Speak cool. again. Thank you very much. So, slightly.